The Fossils of Saginaw, Michigan's West Side The west side of Saginaw, Michigan is rich in history and prehistory. There is quite an array of fossils to be seen here if you keep a keen eye peeled. Thing is, most of the ones I'm going to tell you about um, today were brought here, say, between 1880 and 1900, not for the fossils, but for the decorative use of the, of the fossil-bearing rock. The rock here described did come from Michigan, either Alpena to the north or uh, the Thumb area to the east. The stone in question is limestone, and uh, there's a lot of it. Here in the west side, you will see where the slabs were used for walkways, fences, and garden borders. Um, you can see because many of them are still existent. Even the biggest of these slabs are not very large for the most part. The largest I've seen might would measure about 20 inches by 20 inches by 3 inches thick. Most are considerably smaller. And again, most do not contain fossils that you can see, but they may have fossils on them and in them that are microscopic. I happened upon a slab of limestone yesterday, <clears throat> April 12th, as, a, as my friend Jean and I were taking her dog Buddy for a walk. On the way we took, on the way that we took, there was a, a house which is now abandoned and the windows were secured over with plywood to, to keep out intruders. I saw the limestone in a circular uh, flower garden, the, the edging around it, one piece of this limestone. And I was drawn to it right away because you never know what you're going to find. So I went over and I picked it up and there uh, were dozens of fossil impressions of the den <coughs> dentilium uh, in various stages of completeness. An awesome specimen which has extremely nice detail. Due to their shape, the dentilium is also called a tusk shell and sometimes is called the tooth shell. There are 50 plus varieties of dentilium making a long family tree from prehistoric times to present. The, den the dentilium is a mollusk, uh, much like a snail and you know so on. The foot of the animal extends from the large end of the shell as in a, as in a snail and is used to burrow through the substrate. They position their heads down in the substrate with the end or tip projecting into the water. The shells are conical and curved in a spiral type way. Unlike other mollusks, these are open at both ends. The large end is the main or anterior aperture of the shell. The smaller opening is known as the apical aperture. Interestingly, the shells were used by the Chumash uh, Native Americans <coughs> excuse me, as a form of money at least as early as 1000 AD. They were all surprised when used in various forms as jewelry and ornamentation for the clothing. In the 18th century, Europeans used the dentilium for the uh, medical properties that they believed the shell had. It was thought to have an ex excellent alkali and they were pulverized for use in various preparations. There's a very good fossil record of the tusk shell from the Mississippian era onwards. This makes them the youngest of the mollusks, but for science, the group remains contentious. As a Christian, a born-again child of the true and living God, <clears throat> I have no problems letting all know that I believe these were created just exactly as is told in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. But I don't buy into the young earth theory, <clears throat> which makes me kind of odd in the uh, fundamentalist uh, group. I believe that our home planet is much older than most fundamentalist Christians uh, do today. And back in the early 1900s, in fact, fundamentalist Christians had no doubt about the earth being very, very old. And it was even used, <clears throat> that fact was even used in uh, the uh, page notes of the Schofield Bible of that time. They have since then been removed to, to uh, fit with more modern thinking on the subject. But um, even if I'm wrong and they're right, this is not a point of contention that would affect my salvation, so I'm not going to worry about it a whole lot. What matters to me is that God created everything through the Lord Jesus, and to me there is not the slightest doubt about that. The Mississippian period is said to have been 360 to 325 million <clears throat> millions uh, of years ago. I do have a problem with dates like that. The Mississippian era is believed by scientists to have opened with a slow extinction. Vast forests formed the climate 
uh, which was hot and humid uh, worldwide, giving rise to the Earth being much like a greenhouse. It is also believed that oxygen levels were about 40% higher than they are today and before, they, before uh, Noah's Great Flood. Many of the massive coal forests around the world are believed to have started in the Mississippian. This was a sub-era known as the Carboniferous, and it's quite common in the right locations <clears throat> to find Carboniferous fossils of plants here in the Saginaw Valley. Interestingly, evolutionists to purposely deceive themselves to, to make themselves into uh, an entity that does not have to uh, live by any laws except his own, because if evolution is true and God is false, then we have no true ultimate moral law or authority. But we know that that's not the case. But anyways, interestingly, evolutionists who purposely deceive themselves feel that trees only began forming bark during this time, the uh, Carboniferous. This would be a rather enigmatic situation because, again, according to evolutionists, as bacteria of that era did not have the ability to break down dead wood. As a result, dense layers of, of dead wood should have formed but did not. Why? because everything was made perfect during the creation week. Important to the dent, uh, dental, dentalium were other occupants of the waters that they inhabited. Uh, the waters of the warm, shallow sea that would have one, at one time covered what is now Michigan included um, sharks, uh, coral, little the uh, horn corals, which were a single polyp uh, uh, entity and um, the more complex colony corals. Rhizoan would have been uh, very abundant. Brachiopods, from the fossil record I see around here in Michigan, were extremely prolific. There were ammonites and crinoids, just to name a few. Fossils of many of these species can be found here in Saginaw. Perhaps the most interesting to me were the jellyfish fossils that I found because, you know, I just never expected to find something like that here in mid-Michigan. However, as you consider the ancient history of the area which would become Michigan, it is not at all far-fetched that we would find jolly, or jellyfish fossils here. Jellyfish, yeah, okay, they were jellyfish, folks. <laughs> but um, you see, when all the land masses formed... Uh, Science teaches that there was a supercontinent um, called Pangaea, which would um, <clears throat> uh, which would one day be broken up into the continents that we know now. Saginaw, at that time, is said to have been down around the equator, and later, after the breakup of the land masses, Michigan is said to have been covered by a shallow, warm sea, as I spoke of just a few moments ago. Again, though, as the Bible-believing Christian, I view those events much differently than does the secular world. There's not much written on Michigan jellyfish, so I'm, I'm going to say just a little bit about it because I got onto that subject now. And, uh, as I said, there's very little written about jellyfish in Michigan. Fact uh, number one is that jellyfish don't fossilize well. And uh, why, you ask? Thanks for asking. Soft-bodied animals must be in the... Um, exact proper conditions so that the body does not rot before the process can begin. In light of that, you can see why not a great many are around. However, there have been some uh, quite spectacular finds made of jellyfish. Much of, uh, uh, much of what we know of them uh, comes from a really spectacular find just across Lake uh, Michigan over in Wisconsin. I believe as such, a great deal of the information gleaned from the Wisconsin find would pertain also to my find here in Michigan because it was like a straight line from Saginaw across to the, and I can't remember the name of the town or city, but to where the uh, jellyfish fossils were found over there. And uh, I believe that they, they look like the same species uh, to me comparing pictures with the ones that I actually found. Now I have a suggestion. While I'm telling you about where I found my jellies, uh, go and make yourself a sandwich and grab a cold Coke or beer and relax as we continue with our journey. What kind of a sandwich should you make? Why, peanut butter and jelly, of course. <laughs> For, that was bad, I'm sorry. 
For a number of years, though, I and David lived at 1016 Stephen Street on Saginaw's west side. And the house was very old, built sometime in the 1880s, and, and it was in really bad condition and shouldn't have been occupied by anybody when it was rented to us by someone who claimed to be a wonderful friend. We uh, moved into the dump quite, and were quite let down because um, we took our friend's part, our um, word as gospel. Um, he said that the whole house had been <clears throat> renovated and uh, actually nothing had been done and that's beside the fact at any rate we lived at this house and i dug up many wonderful incredible things in the yard while we lived there both um, historic relics dating back to the 1870s um, native american artifacts i believe um, from the middle woodland but there was also a few relics that i found that were probably in the late archaic period which dates way 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 back and um so it, it was a multi-component site and it was awesome to live there and be able to find all of these different things but um, I was talking about the limestone slabs well just under the grass which had overtaken <clears throat> which had overtaken them were the remains of a limestone slab walkway in one of the slabs was a curious looking depression this would have been a, the bell or head of the animal I could also faintly see the stinging or the uh, stinging stringers underneath the bell the bell of these specimens measured about two and a half inches across they weren't very large <clears throat> on the slab were two such impressions Happen, having never found uh, a fossil jellyfish before I contacted Kevin at the Curio Grove which sells fossils and mineral specimens if you look if you're shopping for a great and fair uh, price on a, on a fossil or a mineral specimen go to the Curio Grove I put it in the put it in Bing or Yahoo whatever you use ask and it'll take you <clears throat> to their online site which is absolutely awesome so but and after Kevin received the images he messaged me back confirming that they were indeed two jellyfish fossils he had a novel way of green lighting them he wrote to me uh, get out the peanut butter brother because you've got jelly <laughs> The next find of uh, fossil jellyfish came the following summer, again on the west side, where the limestone had been used, uh, again, what I was finding had been used as a garden border. Uh, there were four specimens here, and each bigger than the ones I found at home. The bell was a good six inches across. One specimen was just amazing, looking as the lime, um, looking because the limestone had a, had a really strong gray patina to it, and where the specimen was... Uh, the limestone was pink so it was truly a, a lovely piece um before i get off uh, the subject of the <clears throat> jellyfish because this was supposed to only be about the dentellium shells when i began it um i want to tell you just a little bit more about the uh, find in wisconsin because as i said just a lot uh, across lake michigan lies wisconsin and uh from the images i've seen of the find there they looked much like actually exactly like what I found I would like to quote uh, to you from an article published about the fortunate discovery and I quote what a storm that must have been news reports said that hundreds of jellyfish once lived about 500 million years ago but were stranded by a freakish tide or storm on an ancient beach sand later buried them forming fossils with many specimens measuring over 20 inches across um, the, they, they are the biggest um, ancient jellyfish that are, that are known from the fossil record. Found is a Wisconsin stand, uh, sandstone quarry. It might have been an extraordinary set of circumstances that preserved them because geologists say for fossilized impressions of jellyfish, which have no skeletal structure at all, or other hard parts, are extremely, extremely uncommon. Pre preservation of a soft-bodied organism is incredibly rare. But a whole deposit of them is like finding your own vein of gold. Also, quite remarkable, is the, that the rock was sandstone, um, unlike limestone here where I found mine. But that means that they were buried in sand and that uh, the sand became rock rather than fine grain rock like, uh, like mudstone. It was a real granular type rock. Um, in sand, uh, buried, the sand buried the jellyfish quickly. Um, it, which broke down 
because of oxygen readily filters there through their interconnected air spaces between sands of grain, allowing rapid decay. Now, if that sounded confusing to you, it sounded confusing to me reading it, and I'm sorry, um, but that's how it was written, not by me. But the article continued, <laughs> but in fine grain settings, Dr. Hagedorn and his colleagues explained that catastrophic burial and stagnation inhibit decay. Therefore, jellyfish are more readily preserved. You never get soft-bodied preservation in that kind of a coarse grain sand, Hagedorn said excitedly. When people find a T-Rex, for example, that doesn't excite me that much, the man writing the article said, because a T-Rex has bones and, and teeth, and they're really easy to fossilize. But to preserve a jellyfish, that's hard because it has no hard parts. Something is there that we don't understand. Um, there was also a major find of jellyfish fossils in Australia. They were of a completely different species. And the oldest ones ever found so far, according to science and evolutionists, um, were found out in Utah. And, uh, they were, that was quite a spectacular find, too. Okay, I've, I've dwelt on the dentillium shell, which was the, what this was about to begin with. And I've talked about the jellyfish. And I do have a video in my playlists about jellyfish exclusively and alone. And shows some detailed photographs of the, uh, of the ones that I found. <clears throat> but there would have been other inhabitants of, this, of the uh, sea there that would have been contemporaries of the... Uh, of the Delantium uh, critter. So I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on these. We'll cover these another time. Um, horn coral was a, a common uh, was common in the waters here in Michigan, and you find their their uh, fossils in abundance. Um, there were also the crinoids, are the some call them the sea lily, but even though they look like a plant, they are actually an animal. And one of the most to me one of the most fascinating animals of the uh, prehistoric periods. Um, there were brachiopods, which were um, much like a, a, a clam, <clears throat> um, a siphon feeder. And let's see, there were also bryozoan, which are still in existence today, as are the uh, crinoids. But the uh, bryozoans that I've seen today in, in lakes and streams uh, aren't really pretty. They look like a great big ball of phlegm that um, Jack's giant hawked up into the water. But when you when you study about them, though, they really are fascinating critters. And there are more, but um, we'll co I'll cover those with you in a, another video. Now, as I sign off from this, I want you to please continue looking at the pictures that are going to be on here. They show a fence here in Saginaw by a dental clinic that borders on Michigan Avenue. And all the stone in that fence is the limestone I've been telling you about. And many of those stones bear fossils. And so uh, yesterday I went for a long walk, took my camera, and uh, shot these uh, images of these uh, fossils. So I hope you'll enjoy them, and thanks for stopping by.